The left is is fascinating to me because they, you know, they're so critical of corporatism and corporations right. and American foreign policy. Even that's something I noticed. Like the left is like the first to be even like modern day progressives. I mean, not like neoliberals necessarily, but they're the first to be like, you know, we're bombing other countries. We're doing all this bad stuff, which they're correct about. And like, and then they'll say like, you know, history is written by the winners and our history is all this and that. Mm -hmm. But the direction they go in is like, no, we need to just focus exclusively on racism and American imperialism rather than looking at it and saying, okay, there's clearly some corruption here within the US government. There's the corporatism and the government interests are so closely aligned that they're inseparable. And yet they'll at the same time adopt all the mainstream talking points of like the corporate press and the news right <laughs> while saying i don't know it just know. doesn't make any sense to me well that's the, funny it's that's on their point, side yeah. that's why they're adopting it yeah it's easy for them to look the other way they should be the ones that are that are critiquing you know the the dangers of capitalism and the media like they're they're mm -hmm. the party of doing that but they're not doing it because they're singing their tune <laughs> so they're just completely uh well, not mentioning it yeah, no, exactly. And that's sort of what broke my brain with SJW stuff from the beginning was this realization that no one really has principles. They yeah, just pretend totally. like they do. And then as soon as they have power or the perception of power, they'll throw all their principles away. And I mean, it's the exact same thing with like, oh, you know, for so many years, the left was very anti-corporation. And then suddenly, you know, oh, when it comes to social media platforms and these other big corporations that are all basically bowing down to whatever the left wants, suddenly all this anti-corporation talk, you know, doesn't go away, but it all gets shoved to the back burner. It's all like, oh, you know, we suddenly yeah. trust Facebook and YouTube and Twitter to use their corporate power to regulate speech and censorship and all this other nonsense, just because it's kind of on our side at the moment, which it's so sad. It's so depressing <laughs> that this is the way people react to stuff. Yeah, they. I don't like the sweeping generalizations that Nance is making because I feel like, like people are going to believe institutions are stacked against blacks if they have that experience. And I mean, I, I as a white person, have had the experience of institutions stacked against me, but I don't necessarily have sure. the. I don't. I don't have the black card to say that it's because I'm black. I just assume it's because I'm like not that powerful and institutions are just you know they they tend to operate there's a political aspect to them that sales but behind the scenes that a lot of us don't necessarily have access to we just we experience that as i'm getting screwed right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely definitely uh race and gender any political movement that's so black lives matter and any of like this a lot of like uh, other gender related things, uh, any other racial one, basically what those movements do, uh, they completely take all the steam out of anything that could have been enacting real change. For example, yes. the obvious answer to the police brutality that we've seen against black people and white people is that police brutality is an issue. And there's, the, you know, let's, let's talk about that. But by making it exclusively a black issue, which is obviously not, you're dividing the movement and now the white people are like, oh, it's all lives matter. And then black people are like, no, it's black lives matter. And then nothing gets done. And then now it's just like, oh, the police are bastards when we say they are, but uh, the Capitol police are awesome because they're on our side or whatever. <laughs> so it just becomes completely divisive right. uh, whenever you separate it along those lines. Because America is set, like, and, and I think this is done on purpose because obviously America has this big mix of races and gender and all that. But what's united us previously has been a shared interest in freedom and opportunity and liberty and all these, you know, great things truly that made America an awesome country. Those are completely ignored on purpose, I think. Yeah. Well, I think the people, like the, the most the majority of the people in these movements are just the useful idiots. They're, they don't, they're not really thinking about this. They're not really saying, well, you know, it's hypocritical for me to say, you know, a cab, and then the support, the Capitol uh, police during the January 6th riot stuff. But I think the leaders of these movements are very aware of what they're doing, very aware of, of downplaying any 
positive benefits of America. And I, and I do think, I do think it's because most of the people leading these very woke movements are fucking Marxist and they do want to destroy liberalism and they do see this as the enemy and they want to divide the country along these, uh, these lines. Yeah. They're basically apocalyptic. They want to tear down all the institutions. I yeah, do, well, exactly. I do see one major incentive problem in our system of government that I, I keep going back to and thinking about over and over again because I don't know how to solve this problem. But there is an incentive for politicians, people who actually have the power to enact change, social change, economic change, whatever, not to... If, if that problem is consistently raising them money and getting them elected, they, they, the, the incentives are reversed. The re- incentives to not solve the problem right. and to you know, slow walk it towards solving the problem just accelerate exponentially. And I feel like some of that is happening here where even to the point, this is why people signal boost uh, like people like Abram X. Kendi and stuff, because he's all he's doing is talking about this, this like fanciful utopian world, but not like there's absolutely no policy goals that you could actually dig in and, and implement. So you're in right. this situation where you're like, this is what we want. We'll elect the person that's going to go here, but there's absolutely no way to, to get us there. Are you saying it's not realistic that we'd have a constitutional amendment to have a fourth branch of government that yeah. would be, have the ability to get rid of all laws that it, are not deemed it's racially not, equitable? It's not It's not feasible. And even <laughs> if it was feasible, it wouldn't work. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah, it's completely ridiculous. But but do you, the, the, the people who are running on this stuff, the people who are getting elected, you know, Democrats basically, are getting elected for this, for, to deliver this vision. And they, there, it's a situation now where, you know, they get elected, and they have the perfect scapegoat for, for not getting it done. You know, it's not that we didn't try hard enough, because you know we tried as hard as we possibly could. But there's these demons on the other side of the aisle, the Republicans, mm-hmm. that kept standing in our way. And you know, if you just give us another two years, another four years, another six years. We can get, right. we'll get there. We'll get there. And every time election season comes along, it's like, oh, we came so close, but the demon <laughs> rose up. The Ben Shapiro's of the world rose up. Is it, is it, is it, I, I just, this seems like a common tactic of Democrats. I don't know that it's a common tactic of Republicans, but I'm certain there's, there's something oh, similar course, going on well, on the Republican side that I'm I probably I was about just to missing. say that it's like th- there's this symbiotic relation, this toxically symbiotic relationship between the Democrats and the Republicans right now. Yeah. And that's what you were saying. So, but politicians always want to, quote, tackle these big, nebulous, vague problems that you can't ever really fix or check if they've ever been fixed in the first place. Right. So for Democrats right now, that's why all this talk of systemic racism is like the perfect issue to focus on. Because it's like, well, how, you know, how does someone measure whether an individual politician fought successfully against systemic racism? You yeah. fucking can't. Like, it, it's, no one even knows what the term means because it can mean whatever you basically want to mean. But it's, it's so it's a perfect rallying cry to fight against because you can never – you can never check to see if they actually succeeded and it will something that will be continually existing that they can always run off the fight against. Yeah. And then at the same token, this benefits the Republicans because if the Democrats are fighting against this vague nebulous problem that can never really be solved, the Republicans can run against the Democrats fighting against the vague nebulous problem that can never be solved. Exactly. At the exactly. Same end. So they're like, we're pushing against this vague nebulous problem that can never be solved. And so you have forever these politicians back and forth in this battle fighting against nothing. And that's why nothing, and that's why we're in this historic time for like the last 10 years where nothing has really been gotten done in our country. We have so much we need to accomplish too, which is right. the hard part. And that's why, I, what is the solution to this? How do you, how do you, 
I don't know. Like it's a behavioral economics problem. It's ha- you have to change the incentives somehow. And I just, I don't know. what. Yeah. Unfortunately I'm pretty black billed because I don't view it. Politics is divorced from reality completely. It's mm-hmm. all these politicians, all these power structures are basically serving economic incentives, mm-hmm. as you guys are saying, which have completely uh, co-opted our government in the mm-hmm. form of corporatism. And so it's almost like, you know, I hate to sound pessimistic, but it feels like the train has left the station on a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And at this point, it's like, I, I don't know, like move move to fucking Florida or something. I don't know Florida what else the solution is. Florida is technically still in the United States, Clink. So I, I don't know if we can. <laughs> yeah, Florida's yeah. going to be underwater soon anyway. So I don't know if that's where you want to move. It's so, not looking great. So are you, so basically your picture of the world is that the economic issues do get solved rather quickly, but they're behind the scenes and done in a way that just serves the economic elite and that the, you know, to get the rank and file to show up at whatever local election or whatever the next election is, you know, they constantly push these social issues, which really are of no, con- like these social issues are not affecting universal health care, which is something we should be concentrating on. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I saw this, honestly, what part of what woke me up to, to viewing it through the through an economic lens is this documentary by Adam Curtis called Hyper Normalization came mm-hmm. out in 2016. He's actually like a, it was from the BBC and he's actually like more of a liberal guy, but he, he kind of just goes into the history of things. And yeah, at a certain point, like the, the banks just took over everything, mm-hmm. the monetary system, the banks, the economy, none of what's happening right now politically has anything to do with uh, with the reality of, of what's going on in our economy. Like even COVID, I think, is a good example where, um, like here, here's a good example. You have COVID as this perfect storm, this pandemic that is all the, for all these lockdowns and stuff. And what is the result? What's happening is the middle class is shrinking, the elite class is growing, and we have a growing class of poverty as well. And you have, you have this war on small businesses. You can't be open at certain times. None of this is about health, in my opinion. It's all about changing the economy, going towards eventually, possibly a great reset or something, maybe mm-hmm. digital currency. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I'm going a little off, off topic, too, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I view it. 